Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our Sunday morning service. Uh, before we begin, um, I said that I would give us give everyone an update on our fundraising. As you know, we're uh, planning on reopening in Ormstown when we do reopen. And one of the things that we want to do is put in a lift type uh, elevator type lift uh, in the church. And so we're raising funds for that. We our goal is to raise thirty five thousand uh, dollars. Prices staying the way they are. Uh, and so far, we've raised 12700 So I just thought I would give you uh, an update on that. So uh, let us open in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, as we, um, as we continue to worship you, even, even though we're separated, Lord, I thank you for your blessings. I thank you for the opportunities you provide. I thank you for your word. Uh, I thank you for brothers and sisters in Christ who are doing everything they can to further your kingdom, Lord. I pray your blessing on uh, this message, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. So today is uh, Mother's Day. We're celebrating Mother's Day, and so I'd like to wish each and every mother a happy Mother's Day. Now, um, when, when I say mothers, uh, I just, I just want, like to take just a minute or two and, and stress something. Um, I want you to understand that when I say mothers, what I truly mean is all women who are motherly. <laughs> uh, uh, because there are women out there who are not mothers, uh, but they're very motherly. Sometimes uh, they can't have children. Sometimes they choose not to have children. Sometimes they're too young to have children. Uh, whatever the case, uh, they may be an aunt or a school teacher or, or whatever thing they do, but they're very motherly. And so um, I just like to stress that that goes for them too. <laughs> I want to talk about two specific mothers in the Bible uh, today and the influence that they had on their children. And it's a Mother's Day message, but maybe it's more of a parent message. Dads can, can listen in on this too because it's not just about mothers. But this specifically was two mothers in this, these two scripture, pa parcels of scripture that I'm going to read. And the first one uh, I want to look at is Hannah. Um, now, Hannah is one of the two wives of Elkanah, and, and, and um, she's childless. We, like we, we read in 1 Samuel uh, chapter 1, verse 6, it says, The Lord had closed her womb. Now, this is, uh, in, in that day and age, this is a terrible thing. To not be able to bear sons, to not be able to bear children is a, a terrible thing. And and she was actually teased by the other wife. It was, if it wasn't painful enough to not be able to have children, you've got the other wife who's having children and is ha seems to have no problem having children, and she's teasing Hannah. Uh, and every year, the family would load up the station wagon and head to Shiloh to worship God. And, and so uh, for Hannah, this time seemed to be, uh, we only read about one instance, but I just imagine that it was a time of pain and a time of sorrow, uh, a time of soreness, uh, not, not a time of joyful worship. So, so one year, Hannah decides to do something about it. And, and unlike Sarah and Abraham, you know that story, Sarah couldn't have children, and, and so she chose her handmaiden to, to sleep with Abraham, and a child was born. She, this is not what Hannah does. She's not trying to... Uh, have a surrogate child through one of her servants, she turns to God. And I think that just starts things off on the right foot, right? So in 1 Samuel uh, chapter 1, verses 9 to 17, uh, it says, once, uh, and so, so here they are, they're in, they're in Shiloh. I just want to set the stage. They're in Shiloh, they're worshiping God. This is their annual pilgrimage that they do to go to Shiloh and worship. And it says, once they had finished eating and drinking, in Shiloh, Hannah stood up. Now Eli the priest was sitting on his chair by the doorpost of the Lord's house. In her deep anguish, Hannah prayed to the Lord, weeping bitterly. And she made a vow, saying, Lord Almighty, if you will only look upon your servant's misery and remember me, and not forget your servant, but give her a son, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life. And no razor will ever be used on his head. As she kept on praying to the Lord, Eli observed her mouth. Hannah was praying in her heart and her lips were moving, but her voice was not heard. 
Eli thought she was drunk. And he said to her, How long are you going to stay drunk? Put away your wine. In verse 15, Hannah says, Not so, my Lord. I am a woman who is deeply troubled. I have not been drinking wine or beer. I was pouring out my soul to the Lord. Do not take your servant for a wicked woman. I have been praying here out of my great anguish and grief. Now, now, good on her, <laughs> right? I, I just want to, I got to stop there. There's one more verse that I want to read, but good on her. Uh, Eli jumps to conclusions. Uh, I mean, how can somebody be standing there mumbling, nothing coming out of their mouth? They must be drunk. And, he, and he, he's got the audacity to say it to her face, like, you know. But then, good on him, because when she says this, Eli answered, go in peace, and may the God of Israel grant you what you have asked of him. So, so he realizes his, his mistake. Now, I don't hear him apologize, <laughs> but he realizes he's wrong, and he says, you know, may God grant you what you, what you long for. So this, uh, she is childish, but she has the heart of a mother because she says, give me a son and I will give him back to you all the days of his life. She is not trying to do this in her own power, but she's, she's reaching out to God and asking him to do this. And you know what? God heard her. God heard her. God heard Eli. God heard both. I, I don't know how you wrap that up, but God heard. And so we continue on because that, that's like the first, the very far, uh, very first part of the chapter. And we read to verse 17, but in verse 19, it says, early the next morning, they arose and worshiped before the Lord and went back to their home at Ramah. Elkanah made love to his wife, Hannah, and the Lord remembered her. So in the course of time, Hannah became pregnant and gave birth to a son. She named him Samuel, saying, because I asked the Lord for him. That's what Samuel means, asked of the Lord. So because I asked the Lord of him, I, I'm naming him Samuel. Um, is this not a, a, a motherly characteristic? Like, I just, I, I think it is. And, and when, he, he, when he was about 10 or 12 years old, she took him to the priest Eli to fulfill her promise right? She made a vow. If you remember, she was standing there praying, and, and she said, God, if you would just do this, uh, here's my vow. I will bring him back to you, and he will serve you all the days of his life. So, so God heard her. God answered her prayer. Eli said, may God do what you have wished. May he grant it. So God granted it, so she's fulfilling her vow. And, and I find it interesting that God didn't say, well, just kind of put him over in the corner. We'll find something for him to do. You know, yeah, we've been looking for someone to sweep floors. And uh, who knows, maybe as a young boy, that's how it started. But, you know, it, it's not like God did not have a plan. God, God didn't go, okay, now what am I going to do with this kid? So in 1 Samuel chapter 3, verse 1, it says, The boy Samuel ministered before the Lord under Eli. And then it says, in those days, the word of the Lord was rare, and there were not many visions. <laughs> the word of the Lord was rare, and there were not many visions. Sounds like our world, doesn't it? The word of the Lord is rare, and not many visions. There was a day here in Quebec uh, when the ho every household gave one to the ministry, right? It was like you had to have a priest in the family. Uh, especially in the French-speaking uh, Catholic families. Every one of them had a priest. And that's sure not the case anymore. There, there is a reason why I do 14 weddings or 15 weddings a summer, uh, present circumstances excluded with the COVID thing, but there's a reason why I do it. And it's, I don't believe it's because I'm po the popular guy. It's because I'm the only guy. Like there's very few ministers in the Shadigy Valley. And, and very few people to do that kind of thing or to do funerals. And I do a lot of funerals and weddings for people I don't know uh, because there's nobody else to do the job. Uh, but you see, God had a plan for this boy. And, and I think that's incredible. So if we, that, I read the first couple of verses of chapter 3, but now verses 19 and 21, it says, The Lord was with Samuel as he grew up, 
and he let none of Samuel's words fall to the ground. Now, I just, I just want to stop right there. He let none of Samuel's words fall to the ground. Now, that, when I read into that, this is what I read into that. It doesn't mean that everything Samuel said, God did. <laughs> because if we read on, it says, And all Israel from Dan to Beersheba recognized that Samuel was attested as a prophet of the Lord. So, so what it's saying is, Samuel spoke what God told him to prophesy, right? So when it says the Lord was with Samuel and he grew up and he let none of his words fall to the ground, it doesn't mean everything Samuel said was going to happen, happened. It means Samuel said what God told him to say was going to happen, and then it happened. The, it says the Lord continued to appear at Shiloh, and there he revealed himself to Samuel through his word. So, so remember what I read in the verse 1. There wasn't... A, there wasn't a lot of preaching about God. There wasn't a lot of visions. And then in verse 19 and 21, especially verse 21, it says, reveal himself to Samuel through his word. God heard the prayers of this motherless mother and blessed a nation through him. So I guess my first question is, are, are we as parents, are we as mothers and fathers, are we reaching out to God in earnest prayer for our children? And, and, and I, I just want to put on the brakes again here and say, I'm speaking to myself here, right? God, God's talking to me. I'm looking at my children and I'm going, where are they spiritually? A am I earnestly on my knees for my children? Am I earnestly on my knees for my grandchildren? Uh, and, and don't kid yourself. I, I, I love all my offspring and would gladly sacrifice my life for them in a heartbeat. But... Am I on my knees for them? Are we willing to leave it in God's hands? Like to pray about it and trust God that God is going to hear that prayer and is going to act? And, and maybe harder question is, are we ready to leave, willing to leave them in God's hands? I remember one of my biggest decisions was when God said, give me your children. And, and I thought, I don't want my children to go into ministry because ministry is tough. Ministry is hard. Uh, we interview uh, young people that are heading into the ministry, or, or not even young people, people that are heading into the ministry. And, and I like to say to them, you know, ministry's hard. It, it, this is not easy. And if you're not sure of your calling, don't go, because without God's support, you will not survive it. So uh, are we willing to leave them in God's hands? Just, just taking them to church is not enough. Eli, right? Eli, the one we're talking about, Eli was the high priest. And he had two sons. And you know what they were? They were scoundrels. They grew up in the temple. They knew all the rituals. They saw the dedication of Eli. He tried to talk to them. They wouldn't listen. They were scoundrels. And their father was the high priest. Taking them to the church is not enough. The second mother I want to talk about is... Uh, Jochebed. Jochebed was the mother of Moses. And so, listen to this. Uh, we, know, we know the story of Joseph. Uh, Joseph uh, was, was uh, the, the youngest, or the second youngest of Jacob's kids, and he was the kid with the, the fancy coat, and his brothers hated his guts, and he kept telling them, he, first he'd tattle on them and he'd squeal on them, and then he had this special code, and then he told him, you know, one day you're going to bow before me. And it's like, I mean, I got two older brothers. No. <laughs> you just try and survive in that community. You, you don't try and rule it. And, and it, so his brother is like, they're going to get rid of him. They, they pitch him down a well. One of the, then they sell him. And, and he ends up in Egypt as a slave, and, and he goes through this trial, and he goes through these hard times. And then when he's in prison... Uh, he, he, he is brought out to interpret Pharaoh's dream, and he interprets it. And we, and we know the seven years of, of, of plenty and then seven years of famine, and he saves the nation of Egypt and the nation of Israel because, you know, Pharaoh puts him number two in charge, and his brothers come to buy grain, and we know the whole thing, and he tricks them, and he puts a silver cup and a Benjamin's bag. and Anyway, he ends up that they're, they're all there. But the nation is growing. The nation of Israel is growing within the boundaries and under the umbrella of Egypt. And now 
uh, Joseph and all his family, all his brothers, all that line generations ago have passed away. And, and, and Pharaoh is not the same Pharaoh. And nobody remembers, it seems, what Jacob and Joseph did for the nation of Israel. And so they've got them in slavery. They're, they're, they're working as slaves. They're, they're, they're making bricks. They're building pyramids. They're, they're doing dirty work. We read about that they're making bricks and, and all this stuff. So the Israelite people are too many, so the king gets worried and says, you know what, if, if these guys rebel, they could just take over the nation. They could just overthrow us. They could just mow us down like a bulldozer. So, so we're going to do something. We're going to start to limit their numbers. So he says to the midwives, I want you to strangle the, the baby boys. Yeah, keep the girls because we like the girls, but we don't want the guys. So the midwives refuse to do this, and they say, you know, these, these Israelite women are so hardy. By the time we get there, the babies are already born, and they're, they're suckling, and so we can't grab the kid and choke it, you know, so uh, we can't do that. So then Pharaoh takes this bold step and says, okay, we're going to start drowning them all. We're going we're to kill them all. We're going to get rid of them all. And uh, Jochebed has a son. She has this child, and she comes up with this plan. So in Exodus chapter 2, verses 1 to 10, it says, Now a man of the tribe of Levi married a Levite woman, and she became pregnant and gave birth to a son. This is Jochebed. When she saw that he was a fine child, she hid him for three months. But when she could hide him no longer, she got a papyrus basket for him and coated it with tar and pitch, and then she placed the child in it and put it among the reeds along the bank of the Nile. Now, you need, you need to pay attention to that. We get this image of this basket going blah, 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 down the river. No, she, she hid it in the reeds. The like, kid wasn't floating down the river, all right? He was floating in the river. So, um, and, and sister stood at a distance to see what would happen to him. So, so she puts him in the reeds where the current won't take him and says to her sister, watch him. Then Pharaoh's daughter went down to the Nile to bathe, and her attendants were walking along the riverbank. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her female slave to get it. She opened it, saw the baby. He was crying. She felt sorry for him. This is one of the Hebrew babies, she said. Then his sister, okay, Moses' sister, asked Pharaoh's daughter, shall I go get one of the Hebrew women to nurse the baby for you? And she says, yes, go. So the girl went and got the baby's mother, right? So... So she goes and gets the mother, uh, Moses' mother. Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this baby, nurse him, and I will pay you. So the woman took the baby boy, nursed him, and when the child grew older, she took him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. She named him Moses, saying, I drew him out of the water. So as we begin the story, we, we almost think that this, this birth mother's influence is done, right? She, she, she takes him to her. And, and she's done with him. God provided her a way to spend some of the very formative years with her boy. And, and again, she probably would have had him till he was 10 or 12 years old before she takes him to, to Pharaoh, Pharaoh's daughter. His mother took every advantage she had to teach him her faith and all about his people and their history. He goes back into Pharaoh's house, or he goes into Pharaoh's house, knowing full well that he's a Hebrew, and knowing full well what that means. He was raised in the house of Pharaoh, but deep inside he knew he, who he was. And we read this in Acts chapter uh, 7, verses 22 and 23. It says, Moses was educated in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was powerful in speech and action. And then it says, when Moses was 40 years old, he decided to visit his own people, the Israelites. Now, now think about that choice, right? Okay, so, so on, on one hand, we have the home of Pharaoh. We have my adopted family. They got all the money and all the silver in the world. Your belly is always full. You got the best education. Uh, life is grand. You sleep in a nice bed and, and everything is, is, is peachy. And over here, you've got your, your birth, your, your natural family, and, and that consists of slavery and abuse, uh, potential death, uh, uh, hard times and a hard life. And Moses picks this one. 
right? We read about that in Hebrews 11, verses 24 and 25. By faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He refused it. He chose to be mistreated along with the people of Israel that rather than enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. By faith he left Egypt, not fearing the king's anger, he persevered because he saw him who was unseeable. And Moses followed God, and together they changed our world. This is, is, is incredible. Imagine the influence that Moses' mother must have had on him in those 10 to 12 years. Imagine, we, we, we are thinking about moving to Ormstown. Uh, and, and Armstown is growing, and, and there are, there's a new development going up. There's another development over behind uh, the Super C. There's a big development there. And, and these places are bust, bursting with small children. I, I know someone who, who lives in that area and says, Halloween time, I make 300 baskets of, or packages of candy, and by 8 o'clock at night, it's all gone. The, the streets are crazy with small children. You drive a school bus down there, and it's just crazy with small children. Well, you know what? We have an opportunity as a church. We have an opportunity to influence these small children. And look at the influence that this woman had on her son Moses. Now, you're going to go and live there, and you're going to have everything you, you need physically. You're going to have every opportunity a person could have physically. But I want you to know spiritually who you are. You are one of God's chosen people. You are part of the nation of Israel. You are a Hebrew, and this is your God. This is more of a parent's message than a mother's message. I know it, but we have just a short time with them. We realize this often too late. As a church family, we have the same responsibility. We need, we need to seek God's direction for them. We need to look at the opportunities that we are given, and we need to step through them for all people. I had an opportunity today that was just amazing. Um, I actually am filming this on Friday, but I just came from getting my first COVID vaccine. And when I walked in, one of the ladies that was there said, oh, can I stick a needle in him? And I looked over and we started to laugh. And we went to high school together and she was a nurse and back when I was nursing and we never worked together, but she was working and, and, and I know that she'd retired. And she says, no, I'm not giving needles. I'm, I'm volunteering. I'm just, I'm taking down paperwork, but I'll, I, I'll take your information. And she goes, but I, I'd like to give you a needle. And, and she's smiling above her mask. And I said, yeah, I'm sure you would. And she said, uh, no, I retired, and she said, my husband's working in Plattsburgh, and I was volunteering down there, but she says, the borders are closed, so she says, we're, we're kind of separated, because he's staying over there to work, and I'm here. And the hospital wrote letters and everything, because I was willing to go over there and stay there, and I, I just can't get there. So she said, what are you doing? So I told her, I'm pastoring the church, and she goes, okay. And she goes, well, you'll have to bless me before you leave. I said, okay. So they... they they did all the thing, and they, they give me my shot, and you got to sit there for 15 minutes. So I stand up to leave, and uh, I call her. I said, come here. And we're standing there in the middle of the vaccine clinic, and she goes, what? What do you want now? I said, I want to pray with you. And she looked up, because she's quite short, and she looked up at me, and she goes, right here, right now? I said, yes, right here, right now. And so I prayed for her, and I prayed that she would able, be able to get back together with her husband there or here or whatever, but that God would open that door. And, and, and she was shocked. But we have so few opportunities that when that door opens, step through it. And we have our children and our grandchildren for such a short time. We need to have the heart of these two mothers to present them to God, to, to beseech God on their behalf, to teach them about our God and our faith. Not through our words, but through the way we live our life for the faith that we have. Not that we're out there criticizing everything that's happening in this world, but that we are blessed by a wonderful, amazing, and loving God. So, so I like that song, May the footprints that we leave lead them to believe. Well, let's pray. Let us, let us leave footprints that they can and will want to follow. Let's pray. 
Dear Heavenly Father, I pray that my faith would be enough. I pray that my witness would be enough. I pray that you would bless my children through me, Lord. Give me opportunities to speak to them about who you are. I, I pray your blessing on all the mothers today. May they just have a blessed day. In Jesus' name, amen. Happy Mother's Day. God bless. Have a great week.